Hello, hackers. This is a talk about a bug in the microtech. And I'm Nini Chen, a security researcher at DevCore. We are from Taiwan. Am I also a member of Belson CTF team and a member of Undefined? OK, why? Why the router OS? Because we want to participate in the Pong to Own Toronto in 2022. As one of the targets, the rotable of Microtik hasn't been exploited in the previous event. More correctly, no one tried to demo exploit against this target in the context. You may already know the rules of the event. Participants must find a pre os RCE with no in user interaction to acquire the points of the target. And the sole host mesh up. A special category was introduced in 2022. Participants have to chain a router when site exploits and another device is exploits to earn the points and bounty. The bounty and point in this category are relatively high, so it's a good target for us to earn more to win the contest. Let's recap some basic things quickly. The router, the router board of Microtik is quite popular, and the router OS is the op operating system of router board hardware. By scanning the Microtik, we can observe about 3 million devices online. Router OS is a standalone operating system based on the Linux kernel. And Microtik also offers ISO images, so we can run it as a VM. It's closed source and also a closed ecosystem. According to the download terms on Microtik's website, you pay 45 bucks to get a GPL source code. What a bargain. And currently, there are two versions of Roto OS, the V7 and the V6. They should be considered two branches because their implementation are slightly different. And the cloud hosted router is the Roto OS image for, for, for VM but only the AMD64 version is available. Most of the service on Roto OS are implemented by Microtik themselves, and they share a similar architecture, so we name them Nova Binary afterward. And they use Nova Message to talk to each other. Though the Roto OS is based on Linux kernel, users are trapped inside a customized CUI, and there's no official method to access the underlying Linux system. Only developers can install a backdoor package to access the Linux system for debugging purpose. An administrator can manage their routers via the web panel or Winbox, which is a Windows GUI application. It's also a popular attack service because the Winbox interface on the router can be used to talk to other Nova binary. Some of them can be accessed without authentication. To understand how people research the router OS, let's have a look at past CVEs of the router OS. There are a total of 80 CVEs, and 28 of them are pre os exploitable, and the victim is the router itself. Six, 16 out of the 28 are those in various components. Eight out of 28 are DNS poisoning, allowing the attacker to MITM or uh, firewall evasion. Only four pre os vulnerability in history can lead to a shell or logging as admin directly without user interaction. These are what we care about. Three out of four were found between 2017 and 2019, and three out of four are in the wild. Let's have a close look. CVE 2017-20149, aka Chime Ray, is one of the exploits leaked from the CIA in the 2017. By sending an HTTP request with crafty content lens, we can corrupt stack to execute arbitrary code by, slack, by stack clash. CVE 2018-7445 is a buffer overflow in SMB found by black box, black box fuzzing. CVE 2018-14847 is also one of the exploits leaked from the CIA in 2017. This bug allows unauthenticated attackers to read arbitrary file on router OS. 
It sounds not a big deal in the first place, but since the password store on router OS was from simply repeating XOR password in plain text with the hash of the username and the fixed string at that time. So the password can be recovered easily, and the bug with arbitrary file reading is sufficient to log in as admin. CVE 2021-41987 is a heap of overflow in the decode of the SAP service. This was discovered on an APTC2 server in 2021. As we can see, these vulnerabilities are mostly in the wild. We can learn too much from them directly. So let's take a look at some talks and articles about the router OS. In 2017, there are three talks, and they are about the package format adopted by the router OS, the developer's backdoor, how the router OS store the password, etc. Uh, talks are interesting and helpful to have a big picture of the router OS. In 2018, the talk, Bug Hunting in Router OS, analyzed the normal message in binary and JSON formats, introduced the how Winbox client talked to the Winbox interface by normal message and found the post all stack overflow. In 2019, the first one is the same as the previous one. So the next one is Microtech Firewall and Net Bypass. It's a talk about the vulnerability in the Winbox that can be used to scan the intranet if the Winbox is exposed to the intra internet. The next, finding the and exploiting CVE found a stack buffer overflow in SMB by black box fuzzing and explained how they got the shell with their exploit on the router OS VM. And the deep dive, microtech exploit, is a security uh, analyze about the CIA exploits and the massive exploit event based on the liquid payload. The next one, help me vulnerability, you are my only hope release a tool to help users to jailbreak their device to check if leaky exploit was already compromising them. And the last one, router OS chain to root is, a, is about chaining DNS poisoning vulnerability and a downgrade attack to get a shell. <laughs> Finally, in 2022, pulling Microtik into the limelight took more about Nova message and disclose a uh, post os vulnerability in Triple W that can be used to jailbreak. They also released a tool to help researchers quickly get a shield on the AMD64 version of router OS with the vulnerability. It seems that the whole world is talking about the normal message in the IPC of the router OS. So we also try to understand what it is. Let's talk about the IPC of router OS with an example. While a user logging through the telnet to access the console of router OS, the telnet will immediately call the EXECL to execute the login process to ask the user for a username and password. Then the login process will send a Nova message with the username and the password to the user process to check if they are correct. The user process also responds in Nova message. The normal message consists of key value pairs, and the key can only be numbers. The key, the sys2 and the sys from are arrays containing the ID of normal binary and the ID of the handler. The communication between two processes is something like this. Every message is sent to the loader via socket, and the loader dispatches the message to the corresponding binary. The login process send a request with a username and password to the user process. The, val the value of sys2 means the target is the handle of 4, and the binary ID is 13. And the process itself does, doesn't have to fill the sys from with its process ID, because the loader, we do, this, we do that based on which socket is received the message from. Next. Uh, the loader removes the target binary ID in sys2 as the source ID to sysfrom, and then forward the message to the target process. When the user process receives the message from the socket, it also removes the handler from the sys2 and pass it to the corresponding handler. Then the handler does the rest of thing. 
We mentioned that the Winbox interface on the router OS is a popular attack service since it can be used to access all the process. That's because the protocol Winbox client used to talk to the interface on the router is basically a Nova message in the TCP packet. So if the target handler fails to check the sender's pri privilege, that can cause problems. No Nova message is type value mapping and can contain various types and also Nova message itself. Because the JSON format of the Nova message is deprecated, so we only talk about the binary form today. Okay, the M2 at, at the beginning is the magic bytes for the Nova message. Then it used four bytes to describe a key. The first three bytes of key are ID, and the last byte is, is type. And the bytes following are the value for that key. So this message's ID types and values look like this. Types like bool can be expressed with one bit, directly using the lower bit of the type bytes. To understand which binary corresponding to the ID in the sysfrom and sys2, we need to pass x3 file under the loader directory. It's kind of XML, but in binary form. If the binary was introduced by installing a package, its ID is under the loader directory of that package. Some IDs can, can be found in the x3 file because the process is not persistent. The ID is just a serial number, like the locking process we just mentioned. Other binaries also have their X3 files for a different purpose. For example, the X3 of triple W of triple W describe which URI should be handled by which servlet. It seems like it's a good target for fuzzing, right? But we can't just fuzz it and expect that we get something after two months. Now, it's a spoiler. While we were writing our exploit with the vulnerability that I will introduce later, a uh, talk at POC 2022, MicroTik router OS security, the forgotten IPC message. Though I think it's far from forgotten, but anyway, the talk is about fuzzing and the Nova message. And it found lots of post OS CVEs. By the number of CVEs, it looks like the father has been running for a long time. A bit of an afterthought, I don't think we can get a better result if we do the same thing at the time. Not to mention that we only have two months. So, is it still possible to pwn the router OS? Review these CVEs again. Most of the, most of the vulnerability we think interesting were discovered many years ago. Researchers also found lots of vulnerability, but as we can see, the microtech becomes safer and safer. But in 2021, a vulnerability in the SCEP server we just mentioned was discovered by analyzing an in a wild exploit on the APT C2 server. Was it, uh, was it undiscovered until, until then because it was not a default feature? Or is it just because people have overlooked something? Most talks and articles focus on jailbreaking, analyzing the inner wild exploits and Nova message in IPC. I have a summary after reading them and starting to reverse by ourselves. That is, no one with sanity would like to dive into the details of Nova binaries. I mean, it's expect for the exploits from the CIA and APT. Most of the research about bug hunting is fussing the protocol playing with normal message or fussing normal message. By the outcome, it seems like attackers are familiar with the router OS than us. We need more details about the Nova message. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against fuzzing, but we have to ensure we check everything. To take, to take advantage of the contest. I don't think the system is perfect now. There is a gap between researchers and attackers. So what was missed if we want to find some pre os RCE box in router OS? The first question is, where are the entry point to the customized IPC? Most of them 
can only access by authenticated user, we can foresee that playing with Nova message in IPC will result in lots of post os bugs. IPC is just a part of implementation of the most functionality. We want to review the crucial part directly and carefully. For example, how does the DHCP process pass a DHCP packet to extract the info in it? Then, we have to mention the architecture of the Nova message, Nova binary. Every Nova binary has a looper. The looper uses port to check the status of socket and process event in each loop, just like a regular event loop you've seen everywhere. Looper is responsible for the communication between the current process and the loader. The looper registers a spatial callback for the unique socket, which is used to communicate with loader. The spatial callback on MSG sock will dispatch the message to the corresponding handle once it receives Nova message from the socket. So, how does the handler work? While the looper receives a Nova message, it will dispatch it to the corresponding handler. Look at the right hand side. And let's assume that handler one is responsible for the Nova message. And then you call a function in Vtable with the CMD prefix, like corresponding to the command specified by the C CMD. There are many functions here, but because the handler is the base class, commands relative to objects are unimplemented. The CMD unknown is often overridden, overridden and used to extend the customized command. Sometimes the developers over override the handle CMD instead of the CMD unknown. You may have already read some of this in a past research. But most of the time, the Nova binary use the derived classes rather than the best handler class. The derived classes can store a collection of objects of a specific type. For, for example, while the user is setting up a DHCP server, they will send a message to the handler zero of DHCP process to create a DHCP server. The handler zero, which is an instance of AMAP, calls the function on its vtable with offset hex 7c to create a DHCP server object and insert it into a tree. The 7c is the offset to the constructor of the inner object. And you can find the offset of such function in other derived classes by reversing the CMD add object. In the previous example, the web panel sends a Nova message to DHCP to create a DHCP server. But what if I told you that some functionality don't even use the Nova message? Take the CDP and the LLDP, for example. They are implemented in Discover. The looper registers two callback functions. The looper keeps looping and checks the status of sockets. If there are incoming packets, the looper calls the callback function. The callback of CDP will check if the interface that receives the packet is not filtered by firewall rule, then extract the information from the packet and store them directly into another ASEC map without sending Nova message. So there's no Nova message here. So we started to review the router OS by enumerating functions and reversing them. Then we found something strange. One day, while plugging and unplugging some cable connect to the router, suddenly the log file showed that RADVD crashed several times. So we tried to reproduce the crash by manually plugging and unplugging cables about a thousand times, but couldn't figure out the crash condition. The condition is unknown, and the crash appears randomly. Instead of mindlessly unplugging and plugging the cables, we reverse the RADVD to see if we can find something interesting. We didn't find the root cause of the crash, but we got something better. So why is RADVD? RADVD is a service about SLAAC of IPv6. Let's say a computer or a node wants to get an IPv6 address. It offers the multicase the router solicitation to all router asking for a network prefix. Then, 
if a router receives the RS, will, it will multicast a router advertisement with network prefix to all nodes. After that, a node can calculate its IPv6 address by combining the network prefix and EUI64, which is calculated from the MAC address. Another scenario is that if an upstream router, router A, maybe it's an ISP, they give you a prefix with slash 48, which assign in advance by email or something. Then you can use them well, whatever, whatever you want in your LAN. Then here comes the link prefix and router prefix. First, the router B act, act as a node on the interface that link to the router A. Then router B asks router A for a prefix. The router A send a slash 64 prefix for router B to calculate its IPv6 address. Router B calculate an IPv6 address. Let's say it's 2001 colon DBA colon colon 1. And use it on the interface that links to with router A. So now, the router A can route all traffic to the address on the slash 40A to router B. Now, when nodes want to get IPv6 and send RS to the router B, the router B just multicast the slash 40A prefix to nodes. Then the nodes act as usual. So the functionality of RADVD in router OS should have two, functional two functionality. It first, it can act as a node to receive RA. And it can also multicast RA to the LAN. Let's follow the execution flow of RADVD to find the bug. The RADVD have a similar design pattern to the discover process we mentioned earlier. It registers a callback. The looper pull a socket in every loop. And there, if there is an incoming ICMPv6 packet, the looper call the register callback. What callback do is roughly like this. It check if the packet is a valid RA or a valid RS. If it is a RA, then extract information and store them in the handler one, which is a map. And if it is an RA, it will multicast the RA immediately. Oh, sorry, if it is RS, it will multicast RA immediately. There are three cases the router OS will multicast the prefix to nodes. The first one is when you receive the RAs from nodes. The second is when you receive an RA from the upstream router. The last one is when it uh, the, sorry, the last one is the router will multicast prefix in a default period, which is in 200 to 600 seconds. And yes, the router will multicast the RA to nodes once it receives a, a RA. But it's hard to trace this behavior directly because this is about a subscription. I'll talk about it later. We didn't know that then. But the other two cases can be traced directly. directly. The RADVD call send RA right after it receives an RS. The handler one register a timer to send RA periodically. So we can find the send RA function by tracing these two methods. Following the send RA function, we found something interesting while the RADVD deal with DNS advisory. It will advise DNS to nodes based on the DNS list it received from upstream. The ADD DNS function is used to flatten the DNS tree and add it to the ICMPv6. The RA row is the ICMPv6 payload, which is the local variable with the size of 496 bytes. Step into the add DNS, and we can immediately find out there is a probably a uh, Stack buffer overflow. The function add DNS to packets by memory copy without any without any boundary check. That causes stack buffer overflow in if the DNS is big enough. The DNS addresses are from the RDNSS of the RA, but the max length of the RDNSS of an RA is eight by eight bit, which is insufficient to override the return address. 
But if this is not the first time, the router OS receive an RA. The RA DVD have to expire all RDNSS. They max the RD RA DVD flatten another tree to override more bytes for, for us. So what we have to do is we have to act as a bay neighbor that send a router advertisement with a big RDNSS list to the target router. Then send another router advertisement with a big RDNSS list. Now the return address is overwritten with an IPv6 address in the RDNSS of the first RA. It's time to construct the exploit. And it looks easy because there is no protection enabled. So let's find a way to jump on the stack and run our shellcall. That should be easy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the overflow IPv6 addresses are sorted since they were stored in the tree. To make the order of the IP addresses stable to ensure the shellcode is good, we can use part of the IPv6 prefix as a serial number and put a jump and at the end of each address to jump over the prefix because they are not valid instructions. But because of the delay slot of MIPS, which means uh, the instruction after the branch instruction will always be executed before the branch instruction itself. We have to move the jump instruction forward. But the other problem is that you cannot do a syscall in the delay slot. So basically, this is a bad idea. It's actually a CTF 101 problem. Just make a prefix a valid instruction. They won't affect our gadget or shoko, then everything is fine. And because we didn't leak any stack address, plus we didn't find any gadget that can be used to move stack pointer to register T9 for jump instruction in the first place. So what we did here is first write our gadget on memory, then jump to that gadget. Finally, our shoko will be executed. Sounds good, but there is iCache. The MIPS CPU has two caches, the instruction cache and the data cache. While writing our gadget on memory, we are actually writing on D cache. Now, when we try to control the execution flow of execute, uh, sorry, to execute the gadget for running our shellcode, the, process, the processor first check if the instruction are already in the iCache. Because we wrote our gadget on the data section, the cache always miss it. So the memory content will be loaded into iCache. They cause the, process, the, cause the processor to execute a bunch of nope, nope until the program crash. To flush the dcache, we need to make the processor content switch or exhaust the dcache, whose size is 32 kilobytes. There is no slip in RADVD. Other functions we also trap into the kernel, but they don't guarantee the content switch will always happen. To make our exploit consistently successful in maximizing the chance to win the game, we have to flush the 32 kilobyte decache. Luckily, the value in rand randomized VA space of router OS is one, which means the heap is not randomized. The only things we need to do is do some memory allocation to extend the heap and write some gadget on it. We may run out of bytes for shell call because of that. But the DNS addresses were stored in a tree that caused lots of memory space. The heap is already larger than 32 kilobytes during the, proce during the processing of a request. So we can call the memory copy by GOT hijacked to write 32 kilobytes garbage on the heap to flush the dcache for our shellcode directly. And profit. The vulnerability was assigned CVE 2023, 32154, and it's already been fixed. After that, we found the vulnerable code had existed at least since the router OS v6. 
This means the vulnerability has existed since 2013, nine years until we found it, and 10 years until they fixed it. So, no one with sanity would like to dive into the details of Norma binary, QED. You're welcome. Combine the exploit with our exploit from the Canon printer for the point to own. The attacking scenario is that an attacker is a bad neighbor of the MicroTik router, sending crafty ICMPv6 to attack in the router. And if we, if we compromise the router successfully, we can forward our payload to attack the printer behind the router. The whole setup can be simplified as such in the context. Just let our laptop act Act as the upstream router of the target router. We can almost see our 100k button, but another but, our exploit only working on Mac OS and fail on Ubuntu, whether it's a VM or not. We try to debug the exploit by running the exploit on VM and recording the traffic, dump those traffic, and replay it. It just fail as we expected. We also dump the traffic from Ubuntu and replay it on Mac. However, it somehow succeeds. So we guess there is an OS that will reorder the packet. We put a sniffer on router to monitor the traffic from Mac and Ubuntu. And because the AF packet is not affected by any firewall chains, the result should be reliable but they look the same. The last result could be that I have to go to Toronto in person, but we can't leave it like that, because who knows if the bug will suddenly happen again during the contest, even on the Mac OS. Eventually, we find a problem. It's all about speed. The gaps look tiny, and you may never notice in Wireshark, but the difference between them is actually 390 times. The problem is not on Ubuntu, it's just because the Mac sends too packet too quickly, causing rest condition. Plus, we were lazy and did not actually calculate how many bytes we need to override the return address. We just send a bunch of garbage and do the pattern matching. So the solution is put a slip before sending the second RA and fixing the offset of our payload. Then it's very stable. The probability of success is almost 100%. But how? The RA DVD is only one thread. How could there be a rest condition? I didn't mention that while the RA DVD parsing the incoming packet, the DNS address are stored in a vector. But somehow, the handler passes a DNS tree to the add, add DNS function. What's the relationship between these two members? It's actually about why we can't find where the Kobe function multicast the RA when it receives an RA packet. Let's look closely at the Kobe function. There is an array responsible for st storing something called a remote object. Then it looks straightforward. Just iter the new DNS vector, then do RODNS on each of them, and append the result to the DNS remote object vector. So what is the remote object? The remote object is a mechanism to store common resources in the process, and other processes can access them via ID. For example, a DNS remote object is actually stored in the handle 2 of the resolver, and the RIDVD only preserves the ID of the object in handle 1. Now, let's talk about the subscription in Nova Binary. The Binary IP pool 6 is responsible for managing the IPv6 address pool. The DHCP subscribes to it so the DHCP can react to the change. It's done by sending a subscribe Nova message and the sys notify CMD can specify which command you want to subscribe to. The FE OOOB means notification. So if there is another binary, try to add an object to the handler 1 of IP pool 6 by sending a Nova message, the add object of handler 1 will be executed. In most cases, the add object will call send not notifies to notify subscribers who subscribe to FEOOB to inform them that the IP pool 6 has changed. So 
When the RA DVD receives a RA from the upstream router, it calls RO DNS to create DNS remote object for each IPv6 address in the RDNSS of RA. The command add object of handler 4 in the resolver is responsible for such a request and will add the IPv6 object into the handler 2. Also, because the handler 1 of RA DVD subscribes to the hand resolver's handler 2, the handler 2 will notify it with every DNS address says it has now. So the handler 1 constructs the RA for LAN with these DNS addresses. The problem is in the implementation of RODNS. That sends Nova message by post message, which is non-blocking. It means the remote object won't get the object ID immediately. So if we send request too fast, the second RA arrives before the RA DVD gets the object ID of the old remote object. The RA DVD can only soft delete those old objects rather than really delete, delete them. They cause the rest condition. This is what happens if we follow them step by step. Because both processes are single thread, let's assume they are in the first loop of the looper while the RADVD receives the first RA from when with one DNS address. The RADVD creates a remote object in the resolver by sending a Nova message. And the resolver will set up a timer after receiving the first request because it cannot tell how many aiding operations should be grouped. It, should, it just set a timer and send only one notification when the time's up. Apart from notification, the resolver should send a response back to tell RADVD the object ID of the remote object it just asked for. But if we send the second RA quickly before the resolver sends the object ID back, the IADVD can only mark the old DNS remote object as destroyed. Then keep going to cre create the DNS remote object for the RDNSS in the second RA. Then we'll send a request to the resolver, but, uh, but as I say, we send the second RA too quickly. The resolver is still in the first loop, which try to send the object ID it created in the first loop. So our request will stay in the socket. Now, the resolver send the object ID back. The response handler uh, is a callback re registered by the first request. We'll handle the response. The handler finds out the object has already been marked as soft delete. So let it won't update the object ID. Instead, it will post another request to the resolver to delete that object. The request will, will be processed in the third loop of the resolver after the request of creating the DNS remote object for the second RA. In the second loop of the resolver, it processes the creation request with the DNS address from the second RA and the response with object ID. Now, time's up. The timer of the resolver think a group of aiding operations should have been done, and it's time to notify everyone what DNS addresses it has. And because the handle one of RADVD subscribes to the handle two of the resolvers, it receives the DNS addresses in the Nova message, then store them as a tree and use them to construct the RA for LAN in the RA routine. At that moment, the result of two requests is missing. That's why our first version of the exploit can only work on Mac OS, because we trigger the rest condition. It seems hard to achieve a rest condition because there is a timer, but the mechanism is actually more complex than I just explained. So the rest would always happen as long as the two RAs arrive at the router in the short period. So the pattern of the rest condition in the remote object is as follows. Use non-blocking method to create delete remote object. And the target process subscribes to the remote object. 
then we can mix the result of two requests into one. They may make us bypass some checks in the binary. We try to find other vulnerability with this pattern so that we can so that we could register the LAN category of the router in Pong to Own. But we ran out of time and did not manage to find other vulnerability to exploit the LAN side of the router OS. But at least we are the first team to exploit the Soho Smash Up category successfully and also won the title of Master of Pong. Okay. In summary, Microtik re-implement everything with its own design IPC. The business logic is scattered all over. We have to have an abstract concept of Nova binary to find the most critical code to reversing. And there is a pre auth RCE on when that has existed for nine years. Also, we introduced a pattern of risk condition in remote object due to non-blocking method to you. And the last thing, we'll drop tools that we use in the Pong to Own event to ease the reversing of router OS at GitHub. And that's it. Any question? <laughs>